very much for inviting me to speak at the school. Uh, I'd like to thank Shovik in particular for um, being uh, a very good host and uh, for taking care of all uh, the arrangements so well. So the topic that I've been given to lecture on is actually just a two word topic. It's quantum dynamics. Now, the good thing about being given a topic like this is that it gives me in some sense carte blanche to talk about whatever it is that I want to talk about because it's not very specific. And so I thought that you know, I would maybe tell you a few general things about what I think um, is important as far as quantum dynamics is concerned. Um, and so then I prepared a list of subtopics to lecture on. But then the disadvantage of lecturing in the second week of the school is that I watched the recordings of some of the previous lecturers and I discovered that they'd already covered some of the topics that I've, I have planned in, you know, they may not have gone into a great deal of detail, but at least to some extent. So what I'm going to try to do in my set of lectures is maybe go over some of these things which you might have seen um, not in a lot of detail in the lectures of the other lecturers. I'm planning to do these in some bit of detail and hopefully impress upon you the importance of these uh, particular concepts and also to the extent possible try to develop these concepts from the simplest kinds of models, uh, the simplest kinds of models which have the salient features involved in these concepts and then move on to something more complicated. So to the extent that I have a plan for the set of lectures, so these are the topics that I plan to cover. So I'll tell you about sort of classical versus quantum dynamics. the differences and the similarities between classical and quantum dynamics in the specific context of certain kinds of models which are important in studies of this sort, namely spin models. Um, and in and then you know while doing that I'll tell you a little bit about certain aspects of the spread of classical information and quantum information what these things mean and what it means for them to spread. Okay, so that's going to be one topic. Then I'll tell you a little bit about characterizing chaos in quantum systems. Now, you've already had a couple of lectures on chaos in quantum systems uh, given by Leah Santos. And so, I certainly don't plan to go over everything that she covered. Um, what I do intend to focus on though is a particular aspect of quantum chaos which also links it to classical chaos which is the extraction of Lyapunov exponents. when possible for a quantum system and in this context I will introduce you, well okay, I guess you've already been introduced to this but I'll tell you in some detail about something called an out of time ordered correlator. talk for short. Okay. And then I'll also tell you about formalization in quantum systems. Again, something which you have been exposed to to some extent in Leah's lectures. 
but I will specifically focus on the approach to equilibrium for random matrix systems and I'll also tell you why it's important to even consider random matrices in this context. And from there, move on to how these concepts can actually be applied more generically to quantum systems with thermalize and which are described by something called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which again you have heard about from Leah and you have also heard about from Orno, but we will you know, go over this again in my lectures and some specific aspects of um, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So the approach to equilibrium for random matrix systems and extension to systems that obey and since all of you have already been introduced to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, I can just call it ETH for short rather than writing down three big words on the board, eigenstate thermalization and hypothesis. Okay. And then the fourth topic that I plan to cover, depending on how far I get with these and how much time is left, is an introduction to open quantum systems. And in particular, to the quantum master equation, or something that's also called the Lindblad equation. So that's the plan. And I have six lectures over which to cover these topics. Um, I had originally prepared um, material for five lectures, and then I was told that I was supposed to deliver six, so, but I didn't change my original plan. It's still really material for five lectures, which I'm going to try to stretch over six lectures now. So I'll go a little slower than planned, which I think is fine, uh, because you know this is a school. And so please feel free to interrupt me at any point and ask me questions. My only request is that you speak loudly. I'm sort of losing my hearing a little bit in my old age, so just speak up if you have a question. Uh, and you can interrupt me at any point. Okay. So with this, let me actually now start talking some physics. So as I said, I'm going to be lecturing on quantum dynamics. And so I thought it would only be fitting to start talking about a system which is extremely unquantum and extremely undynamic. Okay. And so I'll tell you what I mean by the system being unquantum and undynamic, and then we will make the system dynamic and we'll also make it quantum. So the system in question is again something that you're very familiar with. So I'm at least I'm hoping that you're all familiar with. And this is just the classical Ising model. And to keep the discussion simple. Let's just consider this model in 1D, OK? Now, what do I mean by saying that this model is unquantum and undynamic? So you know, this is a model that you've studied, and you've also done calculations with it. And you know that it has interesting properties, maybe not very interesting properties in one dimension. When you go to higher dimensions, it has a phase transition, and it has interesting critical exponents. So what do I mean by this model being undynamic? So what I mean is the following. So imagine that you had no other degrees of freedom, that this Hamiltonian described an isolated system. So an isolated system whose degrees of freedom 
for the SIZs. Okay, so at every site, you have this SIZ variable, and SIZ can take one of two values, so either plus one or minus one, and that's all you have. There is no heat bath that the system is coupled to. This is it. Okay, so what makes this system unquantum and undynamic? So first of all, what makes it unquantum is that given that these are the only values that are allowed of the degrees of freedom, these degrees of freedom can simultaneously have any combinations of these values. These are all allowed states. So there is no restriction on SIZ at a particular site being plus one or minus one if the other value, if the SIZs on the other sides had some, value, some other value. So in a quantum system, for instance, you know that that isn't the case. If I take a single spin half object and you look at SIX, SIY, and SIZ, each one of those has by itself two possible values, plus half and minus half. But you know that these quantities cannot simultaneously have precise values of plus half and minus half. But there's no such restriction here. So that's what makes this distinctly unquantum in a classical system. What makes it undynamic is the following, that if this is all you had, if you didn't have any other degrees of freedom that this was interacting with, then if you started the system out in some particular state, some particular trail or some particular combination of these SIZs, it's simply not going to evolve. Nothing is going to happen. It will just be in that state forever. And there are many different ways in which you can see this. But the simplest way in which you can see it is that if you all know from your classical mechanics course that if you have a Hamiltonian, any Hamiltonian, which describes an isolated system, and you want to know how some particular quantity evolves as a function of time <clears throat> under the dynamics specified by this Hamiltonian, so let's call that quantity O, then you know that DO DT is given by the Poisson bracket of that quantity with the Hamiltonian. Now, for this particular system, the only quantities that we are allowing are these SIZs, and the Hamiltonian is also just a function of the SIZs, and so you know that the Poisson bracket is going to be zero. The only quantities that we are allowing are the SIZs, the only O's that we are allowing are functions of these SIZs, so nothing is going to evolve. So if you start the system out in some state in which all the SIZs are specified, then it will be stuck in that state forever. Of course, you might say, well, you know, we know that there are dynamical models for something like the classical Ising model, so what does that mean? So that simply means that you're not looking at the Ising model in isolation. So if you want dynamics for this system, for this classical system, then you need to have some other degrees of freedom. You need to maybe couple it to a heat bath, and the heat bath can actually cause flips of these spins, but the degrees of freedom of that heat bath are not included in the Hamiltonian of the system. Okay, so is that clear to everyone? So that's the reason that this model is distinctly unquantum and undynamic. So let's now try to relax these two constraints. And so what we'll first do is, we'll first make this model dynamic, but we'll keep it unquantum, and then we'll make it quantum, and we, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah. Do I have the temperature here? No, I'm saying like if you st want to study the global dynamics, then you have to have a safe temperature. Right. right. Yeah, so the, so the moment you have a temperature in the system, right, an externally imposed temperature, that means that there's a bath that the system is coupled to, and it's the bath degrees of freedom which are providing the temperature and also causing this system to thermalize at that temperature by interacting with the degrees of freedom of the system. So then if you have, if you have a temperature here, an externally imposed temperature, then it's not isolated. On the other hand, if the system were isolated, then it wouldn't thermalize. It wouldn't be able to generate its own temperature because it doesn't have any dynamics at all, right? Okay, so, so now what we're going to do is we're going to make the system, we're still going to keep it unquantum, but make it dynamic. And just to, make things even simpler because we are now relaxing the undynamicness of this system. Let's just look at 
two spins instead of looking at a whole chain of spins. So let me just think of two spins. So we just have two spins in our system. It's an isolated system. And the Hamiltonian of this classical system is just h is equal to j s1 z times s2 z. Okay? But in order to give this, to actually make this a dynamical model now, what we are going to say is that the spins in question are no longer just things which can take on the values plus 1 and minus 1, that there's not just a z component. So what we have in mind now are 3D spins, two three-dimensional spins, S1 and S2, right? So S1 has components S1x, S1y, and S1z. S2 has components S2x, S2y, and S2z. And let's just, again, for the sake of simplicity, assume that these spins, both of them, have a length which is equal to 1. I mean, this is not necessary at all, but this keeps the discussion simple. And so the only constraint that we have is that S1x squared plus S2x squared plus S, I'm sorry, S1x squared plus S1y squared plus S1z squared is equal to 1. That the values of S1, S, S1x, S1y, and S1z have to obey this constraint. But other than that, they can simultaneously take on any values. So there's nothing quantum about the system. This is just completely classical. But this is a strange kind of classical system in which even though we have these other degrees of freedom, which are the components of the spin in the x and y directions, you're saying that the Hamiltonian is just this. And you see why we are doing this for a reason when we extend this to the quantum system. OK. So given this now, this model is no longer undynamic. It's no longer static. If you start the system out in some arbitrary initial state, it will evolve. And you can actually write down the equations of motion. And the equations of motion are obtained pretty simply. So can anyone guess what the equation of motion, the equations of motion will be for this particularly simple system? What will happen to the x, y, and z components of these spins, how they'll evolve? OK, so we can do this explicitly, again, using that expression. So d, s, i, d, t, and i could be 1 or 2. is going to be given by this expression. And we know what the Poisson bracket relations are between the different components of spin, because spin is like angular momentum. And so the Poisson bracket relations between the different components of spin are like the Poisson bracket relations between different components of angular momentum, which you could either think of deriving, if you don't know, from just thinking of the Poisson bracket relations between position and momentum. Or if you just remember what the spin commutation relations are in quantum mechanics, these are just the classical versions of those. And so the relevant Poisson bracket relations are just these, OK, um, where this is the Kronecker delta. And this is the Levi-Civito symbol. So I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with these. And so if you look at spin components um, or for different spins, then their Poisson bracket is 0. Um, because I'm someone who works mainly on quantum systems, I might use the word commutator interchangeably with Poisson bracket. And you, know, you can figure out what I mean depending on whether I'm thinking of a, I'm talking about a classical system or a quantum system. OK. So that's all we need in order to get the equations of motion for these objects. And so the equations of motion are one y okay s one y s one x s two z 
and D and so these are the equations of motion for the components of spin 1 and if you want to get the equations of motion for the components of spin 2 then you just interchange 1 and 2. So that is all there is and you can see that this is completely this Hamiltonian is completely symmetric between 1 and 2 and so the form of those equations of motion will just be identical to these with 1 and 2 interchanged. All right, cool. So that is all there is to the dynamics but if we think of what this actually means physically. So the way in which we can write these down physically, physically in quotes, is this. Okay, so what these equations are telling us is that the dynamics is such that the z component of neither spin evolves with time. So whatever initial state you start the system out in, right, whatever is the z component, that continues to be the z component for both spins. As far as the x and y components are concerned, you can actually combine these two equations into a single equation for the parallel component of the spin. The parallel component being the component that is normal to the z component and you can see that that has this particular form of evolution which is what is called Lama precession. So is everyone familiar with Lama precession? So what is really happening here is that if you look at spin i then spin i is you know whatever initial value of spin it you know whatever initial value it has the evolution is going to be that it is going to process around a magnetic field generated by the other spin. So if you are looking at spin 1, it is going to process about a magnetic field in the z direction generated by spin 2. So please note that I put a bar here. So the magnetic field that spin i feels is along the z direction and is the z component of the other spin. And so all that happens is that each spin undergoes Lama precession. Okay, so so we can also solve these equations of motion explicitly for the spins given some initial condition and so what you see is that so if you solve these equations of motion, so S i x of t is going to be S i x 0 cosine of h i times t minus S i y 0 sine of h i t. So these are not hyperbolic cosines and sines by the way. H is h i is the magnetic field which the ith spin is feeling because of the other spin and similarly S i y of t is going to be S i y 0 cosine h i t plus um, S i sorry S i x 0 here. Uh, no, I think I got this wrong. One second. S i y 0 sorry and then plus S i x 0 sin h i t and s i z t is equal to s i z 0. So that is telling you that the z component does not evolve and the other two comp components evolve in this way. So all of this seems pretty simple but there is actually something interesting that happens here and this interesting thing which happens if you just look at these equations is that even in this highly oversimplified two site model, you will see that there is actually no spread and spread in quotes because you know how much can anything spread in a two site model. 
but there is no spread of classical information. So let me explain what I mean by that. So no spread of classical information. And so what I mean by that is that if you look at how spin i evolves in time, the way that spin i evolves in time only depends on its initial values and the z component of the other spin. The x and y components of the other spin have absolutely no influence on the evolution of this spin. So if you look at how spin 1 evolves, then spin 1 evolves only according to whatever was the initial condition for spin 1 and whatever was the initial <coughs> condition on the z component of spin 2, the initial values of the x and y components of spin 2 don't matter at all as far as the evolution of this is concerned. So you could have started spin 2 out with some parallel component which in some sense was large or small and spin 1 wouldn't even know about it. It would only care about the z component and vice versa. So this is an example of classical information not spreading. So in this context, okay, so first of all, what does classical information mean? So fortunately, classical information is easier to define than quantum information. So for this model, information or classical information is simply the values of all the different spin components. Because if you know the values of the spin components of the two spins at any instant of time, you have complete information about the system. Anything, any physical quantity that you want to calculate about the system, you can calculate if you know what these objects are. So this is what I'm going to call classical information. And here the no spreading of classical information simply means that there are at least two components of one spin which are not at all influencing how the other spin is evolving. And so when we extend this to a larger system, to a full lattice, we see that that continues to be the case if the Hamiltonian has a similar form. But let's, but we'll get there eventually, okay? So that's what I mean by, at least in this simple context, an illustration that there is no classical spreading of information, okay? So this is about as far as we can get with this highly simplified two-side classical model. So what we've done is we've at least made the model dynamic, something is evolving, and there's a particular way in which things are evolving. So now let's make the model quantum as well. So we're still going to confine ourselves to two spins. Okay, so how do we do that? So what we're going to do is we're still going to write down the same Hamiltonian, but now we're going to keep in mind that the Hamiltonian is a quantum Hamiltonian, so it's actually an operator which acts in a Hilbert space. And so that's the reason I've put a hat on top of H, it's an operator. And even the SZs that I have are now operators. And what is the Hilbert space that these operators are acting in? So I'm going to choose a Hilbert space where each of these is a spin half object. So spin one, okay, let me not write spin one, to, so that would be confusing. So let me say one and two are spin half degrees of freedom. Okay, so by the way, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with the fact that if you look at quantum mechanical spins, then in some sense, spin halves are about as quantum mechanical as spins can be. Okay, and then as you increase the spin, if you go from say spin half to spin one to spin three halves and so on, and as you keep increasing the value of the spin, the system in some sense gets more and more classical. So this is about as quantum mechanical as a two spin system can get. Okay, so this is our quantum spin model. So we just made these operators, which, and this is a Hamiltonian that now acts in this Hilbert space. So I was watching the videos of the previous lecturers, 
And in particular, I was watching one of Michael Kastner's lectures in which he had a, an Ising model on a lattice and with long range interactions and a magnetic field, but all the degrees of freedom were Ising. And he insisted that despite the fact that this was an Ising model, it was actually a quantum model that you normally think of an Ising model as being a classical model, but that particular model is as quantum as any other model gets. And I'm also going to adopt a similar point of view here that once, I'm going to show you that once you have raised these to the level of operators, then even though the Hamiltonian is just sort of your Ising Hamiltonian, this is actually going to be a honest to goodness quantum model because this is going to give you a spread of quantum information. So what we saw was that there's no classical information spreading here, but I'm going to show you that there is actually going to be a spread of quantum information. And that, as Kastner also sort of mentioned in his lecture, is a hallmark of something quantum, that it causes quantum information to spread. So we'll see that, and we'll also see what we mean by quantum information in this particular context, and then we'll generalize the notion of quantum information. Okay, fine. So, so this is what we've done. And so the Hilbert space that this model is acting in is basically a Hilbert space of this spin half times the Hilbert space of that spin half. And I hope that all of you are familiar with what the word times means in the context of Hilbert spaces, that you take what's called a tensor product. So each one of these Hilbert spaces is individually two-dimensional. The Hilbert space of this whole system is four-dimensional. So this operator acts in a four-dimensional Hilbert space. And once again, of course, you know, <clears throat> like in the classical case, we are also going to keep in mind the fact that these are not the only operators, that the spin operators also have other components, as an x component and a y component. And the commutation relation among the x and y components of those spin operators is exactly the same as the Poisson bracket relation among the classical components. But you know, the difference being that these are commutation relations between operators. And you also have factors of i and h bar. So let me just write. Mic check. Hello, mic check. Okay, so is everything clear so far? Good. Okay, so then you can ask, well, so just like we've seen the dynamics of the classical model, how do we get the dynamics of the quantum model? And so that is where things start getting interesting. Because there are two different ways in which you can think of the dynamics, which of course are completely equivalent, give you the same answers, but shed light on sort of two different aspects of quantum evolution, one of which does not have a classical analog. So you know that if you have an isolated quantum system, which is described by a Hamiltonian, then the dynamics of that system is given by the Schrodinger equation, 
And this is what this is this is the equation that tells you how a quantum mechanical state evolves as a function of time. So this is one kind of dynamics that you're familiar with for quantum systems. There's also another kind of dynamics, which is of course completely equivalent. It's not a new postulate of quantum mechanics or anything, but that dynamics is written not in terms of a wave function or the state, but in fact, it's written in terms of an operator. So you also have this dynamical equation Okay, so you've got these two things. And I'm assuming that all of you in a quantum mechanics course have actually seen a derivation of the second equation. Now here's where things get interesting. So if you compare this equation to something that I'd written down earlier, this one. So this one actually looks like its classical counterpart. So when I don't put the hat on top, it's a classical object. So the classical equation that I'd written down earlier was this. And this just looks like the quantum counterpart of this equation. You're just replacing the Poisson bracket with a commutator. And you're replacing these classical observables, these classical variables, by operators. But it turns out that while that is indeed true, there is a big difference. Because classically, this equation gives you all the information that you need about the evolution of the classical state. Because if you just think about this spin system again, we said that all the information about the spin system is completely contained in the values of the components of the spin. And classically, this equation is telling you how those values are evolving. So the complete dynamical equation of the classical system, the complete dynamical information about the classical system is contained in this equation. But it turns out that this quantum mechanical equation is a little different. The equivalent of a quantum mechanical state is actually not a quantum mechanical operator, but this object here, which is a state ket. So all the information about the quantum mechanical state is actually contained here and not here, even though this equation is the one which actually looks like the corresponding classical equation. This is the one which has a classical counterpart. This actually does not contain all the information about the quantum mechanical state, as we'll see. So this is where you have a divergence between classical dynamics and quantum dynamics. And it essentially comes from what you mean by a quantum mechanical state versus what you mean by a classical state. And the counterparts of the variables of a classical state, right? whatever defines a classical state, are actually these operators. Whereas the actual quantum mechanical state is this object, which is the state ket, or a wave function, if you like, expressed in some particular basis. And we see that th this difference is the thing which, in some sense, determines the notion of quantum information and also how quantum information spreads in this simple model, even though classical information does not. Like in some sense, there's going to be, even when you write down the quantum version of this, there's going to be <clears throat> so no spread of this, but there is going to be a spread of that, and we'll see how that comes about. Okay? So everyone with me so far? So we also know how you can, you know, just like you can write down those, you, know, you, can, you can get these equations from those differential equations. You also presumably in a quantum mechanics course have seen how you can explicitly write down the time evolution of the state and the operator in terms of their initial values in the Hamiltonian, meaning how you can integrate these equations. And um, so unlike, for instance, the kinds of systems that Orno has been, oh, let me go down is going to be dealing with, in my set of lectures for the most part, h is going to be time independent. And so if h is time independent, then it turns out that there's actually a reasonably simple way in which these evolve. So psi of t is equal to minus i 
h bar t okay actually i need to stop this so, oh. Okay, so this is also, in fact, the way that you imbue quantum mechanical operators with a time dependence. So, if you ask, what does it mean for a quantum mechanical operator to be time dependent? What does it mean for a spin component, which is an operator to be time dependent? This is what it means. This is how operators <coughs> end up with time dependences, how they acquire time dependences, and this is the way that a state evolves. Okay, so now for the particular Hamiltonian that we have decided to look at, this object, which by the way is called the unitary, and even though I wasn't there for Arnob's lecture in the morning, I'm sure he must have mentioned the unitary several times over. For the kinds of systems that he is going to be talking about, the unitary is going to be a fairly complicated thing. For us, it's going to be you know, quite simple. So as an exercise, what you can show, if it's not immediately obvious to you, is that for this Hamiltonian, the unitary is going to be just Okay, so is this obvious to everyone? If it's not, try to work it out. And the way that you can work it out is to first remember that for a spin half operator, this, the, you know, if you look at a spin half operator, the spin half operator is one half times h bar times the corresponding Pauli matrix. And then you can just use some of the properties of Pauli matrices, namely that they, of course, you know, obey that kind of commutation relation, but with a factor of two, that for spin half, because they're Pauli matrices, they also anti-commute and they square to one. So you can use all of these properties and show that the unitary is just equal to that. So if, if, if it's something which you haven't done before, I'd urge you to do it as an exercise, okay? And omega here is j h bar divided by four. Okay, fine. So that's the unitary. And so then one can stick the unitary in here and here and calculate how operators and states evolve as a function of time. So let's just look at the evolution of the operators now. So just like we had in the classical case, the evolution of, yeah, I should really get better at using these <laughs> boards. Right, so, so just like in the classical case, we wrote down the evolution equations for the different components of the classical spins. We can also write down the evolution equations now for the quantum mechanical spin operators. And not surprisingly, because the commutation relations for the spin operators look exactly like the Poisson bracket relations for the classical operators, the evolution equations also look the same. And so if you look at the evolution of this operator, okay, but now remember, you have to remember that this is also an operator and that's going to be important. 
and again you can interchange 1 and 2 and get the evolution equations for the spin operators of spin 2. Okay. So these look exact, oh, and I should also say that H i here as before is equal to j times s i bar z hat. So once again, if you did not worry about the fact that these were operators, you would get exactly the same equation. These are again the equations of Lamo precession. And so you would say that even these quantum mechanical spins are Lamo processing. If you take spin 1, quantum mechanical spin 1, it is Lamo processing about the magnetic field generated by spin 2 and vice versa. Right? Except that these are now operators. And so you can ask, well, even if you write down operator equations like this, how do you actually pull out from this something that is a number, something that you can actually measure perhaps? Right? From operator equations, how do you actually go to equations like what we had in the classical case, where of course the objects in question were spin components, which were real objects. So what are the real objects here? And how do you pull those out of these operator equations? And so the real objects, as you know from quantum mechanics, are if you want to you know, produce objects whose values are numbers from operators, then you have to take the expectation values of the operators in some state. And so here the idea is, if you want to see how an initial quantum mechanical state evolves, and you want to use these operator equations to do that, what you are really asking is the following question. If you were given the expectation values of the operators in that initial state, what would be the expectation values of the operators in whatever state you get to after a time t? Are these equations describing that? Okay? And so in order to see that, in order to see that they do, okay, what we are going to do is, we are going to, oh, may I write this way too far, I guess. Okay, yeah. I will get better with practice. <laughs> Okay, so, so what we want is, so let us just go back to looking at general operators. So if I have an operator O hat, right, and if I want to know what the expectation value of O hat is in the state which the system has evolved to after time t, that is this object. And this object is also the same as the expectation value of O hat of t in the initial state. Right? In fact, that is exactly what gives us the um, equation for the evolution of the operator, demanding that these two objects are the same. That lets us define O hat of t. So now if you look at these equations, so if you all right, so if you now have something like, an, if you have an equation for d o hat dt, suppose you have, you know, which is um, what we wrote down, and if you look at the expectation value of this in the initial state, the expectation value of this derivative in the initial state, the initial state, of course, is just some state. It doesn't have any time dependence, so I can move these into the derivative. And so this is this d d t of psi of t o hat psi of t. So I have moved the initial states into the derivative. And so when I move them into the derivative, I get d d t of this object, which is also the same as d d t of that object. Okay? So if I want to get something meaningful out of those equations, if I want to actually know how those equations describe the evolution of 
the expectation values as the system evolves, then I'm going to take the expectation values of those equations in the initial state. Okay, so is that clear? So let's say we've done that. And after we've done that, so take the expectation values of those equations in the initial state. So now there are no operators left anymore because we're taking expectation values. And so this is what we'll get. Okay, so let me just write this down. And then I'm going to tell you something which might seem contradictory from these. And in resolving the contradiction, we'll see how quantum mechanical evolution is different from classical evolution. So spoiler alert, what I've written here, even though it looks completely plausible, is actually not correct. And therein sort of lies the difference, and we'll see why it's not correct and what the resolution is. But all that I've written here now is just, you know, taking, I've taken those equations and taken the inner product or taken the expectation values of those operators in the initial state, and I end up with this. And these equations look exactly like the equations that I'd written down earlier for the classical system. There are no operators anywhere, you know, everything is now some expectation value. And so the question is, is this correct or is this not? So let's see whether this is correct. So let's just go back to the classical system and let's look at the evolution of the classical system for a very specific initial state. So forget about these equations, uh, well, I mean, these are also the equations for the evolution of the classical system. So forget about the quantum mechanical system for the time being. Let's look at the classical system and let's look at a very specific initial state and ask how that very specific initial state evolves for the classical system, okay? So the initial state that I'm going to consider, so go back, so back to the classical system. Okay, so let's take the following initial state. So the initial state that I'm going to consider is that S1 at time t equal to 0, S1x at time t equal to 0 is equal to S2x at time t equal to 0 is equal to 1, and all the other components are 0 at time t equal to 0. So this is the classical system. So if I start the classical system out with these initial conditions, with this in this initial state, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, sorry, louder? It will stay the same. Nothing will happen. It will simply not evolve from this state because in order for the classical system to evolve, those magnetic fields have to be non-zero. And because I've set the Z components of the magnetic field initially to be zero, and you know that those Z components don't change, the Z components will always be zero, and the classical system will simply not evolve from a state like this. Okay, so classical system does not evolve. Okay? Now let's look at the corresponding quantum system and ask whether the quantum system is going to evolve or whether it's not going to evolve. So first of all, what, what do we mean by the corresponding quantum system? What is the state of the quantum system, which is the analog of this state for the classical system? So a very plausible initial state for the quantum system, which is the analog of this, is to basically start the system out in a state with both spins, in quotes, pointing in the x direction. So what I mean by pointing in the x direction for the quantum system is that these two states are eigenstates of the x operator, 
with eigenvalue h bar by 2. So that is a completely plausible analog of the classical state. Okay, so before we look at how the state evolves, you can also check that if you were to calculate the expectation values of the corresponding operators in this quantum state, if you were to calculate the expectation value of S1 x hat, S2 x hat, S1 y hat, S2 y hat, S1 z hat, S2 <coughs> z hat, then those expectation values would have exactly the same values as these, except for the fact that here you will have an h bar by 2 now instead of having 1. Okay? But the important thing is that in, as far as the expectation values of these operators go, the expectation values of the x components of the two operators will be non-zero and equal to each other, just like in the classical state, and the expectation values of all the other operators will be zero. Okay? So then, if you were to naively now look at these equations and say that what we have here are the expectation values of these operators you know, and all of these things in that initial state, then you would say that the expectation values of these operators would not evolve as a function of time, just like they don't in the classical system. right? But we'll see in a second that that's not right. So, and the reason that we can actually calculate and show that that is not right and something is wrong with these equations and what I did here is because we know how this particular quantum mechanical state evolves from the Schrodinger equation for this state, right? So this is where, so the thing which I wanted to impress upon you, that somehow the Schrodinger evolution tells you something which is in some sense in addition to the operator evolution is going to become clear now. And you see what, what the problem is with doing what I just did here. So we can look at how the state actually evolves as a function of time, because we know what the unitary operator is. Okay, so, <coughs> Excuse me. So we can hit this initial state with the unitary operator, and uh, one second. Okay, so if you hit that initial state with the unitary operator, what you will find is that the state that you will get after a time t is cosine omega t times the initial state minus i sine omega t Okay, where this state, the state with the left arrow, is also an eigenstate of the x operator, the Sx hat operator, but with an eigenvalue minus h bar by 2. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that the state does evolve. And if you think about it, it's not surprising that the state should evolve because the initial state is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So if you have a state that is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, it will evolve. So the state evolves and you say, well, okay, maybe the state evolves, but maybe for some reason the expectation values don't, right? Maybe the, uh, you know, even though the state is evolving, maybe the expectation values of these operators that we've considered continue to be the same as at time t equal to 0. And so you can go ahead and calculate the expectation value, for instance, of S1 x hat in this state. So you can calculate the expectation value of S1 x hat in this state, and you'll see that this is the same as and that is equal to h bar by 2 
cosine omega t right so now clearly something's gone wrong because our previous argument from those equations seem to suggest that these things should simply not evolve with time, that they should continue to have whatever expectation values they had at time t equal to 0. But clearly, the expectation value is changing as a function of time. So something is wrong with those equations. So what is it that's gone wrong with those equations? And what's gone wrong with these equations is that what I've written here on the right-hand side is actually not correct. Because in making this false analogy with the classical system, what I told you, you know, what it seems like from these equations is that each of these is the expectation value of the operator at <clears throat> in the state psi 0. Or in other words, what I have is, I have, if you look at this right-hand side, the product of the expectation value of Siy of t in the initial state times the expectation value of Hi of t in the initial state. But that is not true. What is actually true is that I have the expectation value of the product of these two operators in that initial state. Right? So this object, and similarly here, so this object, oh, sorry. So you, which one? Those equations. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Those were written down just by analogy. No, actually, no. I, I pretended that I did more than just analogy. And now I'm telling you that what I pretended to do was actually not correct. That that's. But which one does it systematically? Right, it? right. And I, I'll show you exactly what that was illustrating. So what I'm saying is that when I write down something like this in those equations, si, x, hi as numbers, I pretended that this was equal to yes, time dependence here. Which, of course, in turn would have been equal to Which I had zero. So that was what I pretended I had done. Right? Which, you know, and, and so so that so I pretended that these two were equal. The right hand side was equal to that object. The left hand side is equal to this object. T dependence. So the left hand side is equal to psi of t. And so if what I had written down earlier was correct, then it would have to be that this here is equal to that. And that is simply not true. That would be true if the state that I had at all times t was actually a product state. Okay? So, so that brings us to this other important concept, which again, you know, you've been exposed to, I guess, in different forms during the course of these lectures or also in earlier quantum mechanics classes. That if you look at that initial state that I wrote down, that initial state was a product of a state of spin 1 and a product of, oh, sorry, a product of a state of spin 1 and a state of spin 2. That's what the initial state is. 
So if the evolution was such that psi as a function of t continued to have this form, or in other words, psi of t continued to be a product of a state of, psi of spin 1 and a state of spin 2, then this would have been fine. But we know that that's not correct. We know that that doesn't happen because we know how the state is evolving. And the state, as it evolves as a function of time, ceases to be a product state. This is not a product state. And so therefore, this equation is in general not true because there's no reason for states that are initially product states to continue to remain product states. And that is the reason that you cannot just write down those equations, pretend that those were classical variables with the, you know, with each one being an individual expectation value and that those are the dynamical equations. So this is where you see this departure between the classical <coughs> system and the quantum mechanical system. Okay. The other, so at the heart of this is the following observation also that there is more to a quantum state than just the expectation values of the observables. So let me give you an example of that. And you'll see, you know, and I'm going to relate that to this evolution of the state to something other than a product state. So let's just look at a different state of two quantum mechanical spin halves. Okay. So here's the state. And this is again a state that you might have seen before in at least in certain limits. So Okay, so if you look at this state, right, and you now start calculating expectation values in this state. So what you can easily convince yourselves of is that <coughs> if you were to look at the expectation value of Six in this state for either i equal to 1 or 2, it would be the same as the expectation value of SIY in this state. And these would be 0. On the other hand, if you look at the expectation value of, uh, sorry, and if you also look at the expectation value of SIZ in this state, that would also be equal to 0. Further, if you looked at the expectation value of SI, S1 Z hat, S2 Z hat in this state, that expectation value would be equal to, can anyone guess what that expectation value would be equal to? In that state? Right? Everyone see that? And similarly, you can calculate what the expectation values are of S1 x hat, S2 x hat, and S1 y hat, and S2 y hat in this state. And so what you see is that to the extent that you can define the expectation values of local observables here. Okay, and what do we mean by local observables? We mean by, we, what we mean by local observables are observables that are represented by operators confined to just one of the two sites, those are all equal to zero, regardless of what the value of phi is. Okay? In fact, even this non-local observable is equal to minus one, regardless of what the value of phi is, because this is actually an eigenstate of this operator with eigenvalue minus one. But if you can, and that's the reason I deliberately didn't write down the expectation values of S1 x hat and S2 x hat and S1 y hat and S2 y hat, if you wrote those down, then you would start seeing the phi dependence. Okay? Now, if you were sort of thinking classically about a system like this, then you would have made no distinction between the product of the expectation values of local operators 
and the expectation value of a product of local operators. Those would be the same because classical, the analogy here is that the limit of this being a classical system is if you confine yourself only to product states of the system, right? So if you had only product states, then the expectation value of S1 x hat times the expectation value of S2 x hat would be equal to the expectation value of S1 x hat and S2 x hat in this state. But if you do not have product states, then these are different. And so if you want to get full information about the state, right? Classically, the full information about the state is just contained in the individual values of these local operators. But quantum mechanically, you see it is not. You actually have to start looking at these non-local operators. And so then you will have to start making measurements of these non-local operators as well. You will have to start looking at expectation values of these non-local operators as well. Incidentally, you might know at least from the consideration of a single spin half object, one single spin half object, that you can get all the information about that one single spin half object if you knew its expectation value along the x, y, and z directions. Okay? Because, so does, is everyone familiar with that concept? So similarly here in principle, you could get complete information about some state of two spin half objects if you measured, the, if you calculated the expectation values of all the right operators, the only thing is that now the operators are not going to be local operators anymore. And so now you can think of generalizing this to more and more spins. Now you can actually think of generalizing this concept not to a system with not just two spins, but with you know, three, four, and, and, and an increasing number of spins say each spin interacting with every other spin, maybe not interacting with every other spin, maybe these spins are all arranged on a lattice so that you only have nearest neighbor interaction or something. All the same, there is going to be this fundamental difference between a classical system and a quantum mechanical system in terms of what you need to measure, what expectation values you need to obtain in order to get complete information about the quantum state. And so as you have more and more spins, you can have more and more terms in a superposition like this involving a larger and larger number of spins, a larger and larger sequence of these spins. And so if you want to get more information about the state, you will have to keep calculating the expectation values or measuring, if you like, the values of operators, which get increasingly non-local. Right? So here you only have two spins. So at most you have a non-local operator, which is a product of two spin operators, one, on, one for site one and one for site two. If I now had a third site, then you would also need, have to start worrying about operators like S1, say Z hat, S2, Z hat, S3, Z hat, or some other combination of the components of one, two, and three, but operators which would involve products of all three spin operators. And as you kept increasing the number of spins, things would get even more non-local. The only time you don't have to worry about anything that's non-local is if your state is always a product state. Then you can just measure things absolutely locally and get complete information about the state, but then you're given the additional information that it's a product state. Right? So therefore, in some sense, because the product state corresponds to a classical state, if you want to quantify, in some sense, this notion of quantum information, something that is not contained in a classical state, then you have to see how far away that state gets from being a product state. So you've certainly heard this word over and over again in the series of lectures and also in other courses. So states which are not product states are what are called entangled states. So quantum information, information which is not classical, which an analogous classic, cl uh, classical system does not possess, is information that is contained in entanglement. Okay, so, that, so whenever people talk about quantum information, people are really talking about different aspects of this kind of information that's contained in entanglement. Now, because entanglement involves superpositions of states and the number of possible superpositions that you can have grows exponentially with the size of the Hilbert space.
Whereas classical information in some sense is confined to just having product states. You can see that it's usually a very hard, it's, it's, going, it's, you know, it's very, very hard to get all the information about a quantum state, to get all quantum information as your number of degrees of freedom increases, right? Because things are increasing exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. So if you want to extract information, quantum information, information that's actually contained in the entanglement, then you have to come up with some measures which don't really you know, involve having to calculate an exponentially large number of numbers, somehow trying to quantify this quantum entanglement with a smaller number of numbers. And indeed, there are many different measures for doing that. But the one that's the most useful and in some sense the most intuitive is something that's called the entanglement entropy. Okay? Um, but before I go there, let me also show you another thing about this quantum mechanical state and classical information contained in the quantum mechanical state, which is going to be completely analogous to what we saw with the classical system. Okay. So is everyone with me so far? Okay. So just to make that last point clear about classical information contained in the quantum mechanical state. Let's actually now do the right thing and actually integrate those quantum mechanical equations of motion for the operators correctly. Not do the, you know, the, the cheap trick that I pulled earlier, but actually write down the correct um, equations. So, that takes a little bit more work than, for instance, calculating how that state evolves as a function of time. Because as I had written down earlier, O hat of t is e to the i hat i h hat t by h bar, O hat e to the minus i. Okay? And so you actually have to hit your operators with the unitary twice, you know, the unitary on the side, u dagger on the other side, and calculate this object. So it, it's a little bit more algebra, but let me just write down the final result, and I'd urge you to do the algebra. So you see that S i x hat of t is S i x hat zero cosine squared omega t minus sine, okay, let me just write this, write this as cosine 2 omega t, so cosine 2 omega t minus S i y hat 0, S i bar z hat 0 by h bar sine 2 omega t and S i y hat of t is S i y hat of 0 cosine 2 omega t plus, plus S i sine 2 omega t And S i z hat t is S i z hat 0, where omega is what I had written it to be earlier. Okay, so this is how the operators actually evolve. If you were to do the, um, if you were to integrate those equations correctly. So you can now write down the operators at time t in terms of the operators at time t equal to 0. So if you wanted to calculate the expectation values of these operators at time t in the initial state, which is equivalent to calculating the expectation values of the operators without the time dependence in the state at time t, then all that you have to do is you have to calculate the corresponding expectation values of these t equal to 0 operators in the t equal to 0 state. Okay? But you can see something interesting here and something that is very much like what we saw in the classical case, which is that the expectation value of this operator, right, uh, si x of t, 
depends only on the expectation values of si x and si y at time t equal to 0 and the z component of the expectation value of the other spin. It does not depend on the x and y components, the expectation values of the x and y components of the other spin. And similarly here, right, and similarly for y and for, so the expectation values of sx and sy for spin 1 at time t only depend on the expectation values of sx and x and y for the same spin at time t equal to 0 and the z component of the other spin at the initial time and vice versa. So once again, like in the classical case, as far as expectation values go, the expectation values of the parallel component of spin 2 the parallel component of spin 2 does not influence the expectation value of the parallel component or any component of spin 1 and vice versa. So once again here, there is no spread of classical information. If by classical information, we mean the expectation values of operators. So this quantum mechanical problem in that respect is exactly like the classical problem but that doesn't mean that there is no spread of any other information and there is spread of other quantum information because what's happening is that your initially a state which was initially a product state is now getting entangled and so if you wanted to back out the entangled state at time t equal to 0 then of course you're going to have to calculate these non-local operators these non-local objects and so the fact that there is this non-locality that's involved in determining the exact state quantum mechanically, which doesn't have any classical analog, is what is giving you a spread of quantum mechanical information. That there is, you know, this, you need to keep going to longer and longer trails of operators. You need to keep calculating the expectation values and making measurements of those operators in order to back out the quantum mechanical state, okay? Just a, small, just a small point. Of course, from what you're saying, it's implied that if you keep on doing your unitary dynamics and you look at a big system, then beyond a certain length scale, if you originally started with an unentangled state, things would stay unentangled, right? So, right. Yeah. So I guess that is what people call this whatever entanglement wave or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in, in fact, I'll give you a, I mean, Okay, so I have about eight, seven or eight minutes. So I'll introduce the Hamiltonian, which will at least now you know, show you some sort of spread of entanglement. So it's not really an entanglement wave, but it's basically you know, entanglement increasing as a function of time. Okay, all right, so is this, is this point clear? So this is, so when I said that I'll tell you about the difference between quantum and classical information, the dynamics of that information, this is what I meant. And so, and I illustrated this with just a simple example of two spins to, to emphasize the importance of entanglement and the fact that to back out information about a quantum state, you really need to keep measuring non-local objects. So now we're going to move to a more sort of, okay, maybe not realistic, but certainly a, a less trivial system. So instead of having just two spins, let's now assume that we have a one-dimensional lattice of spins. Okay, so we have a one-dimensional lattice of spins. And what I'm going to assume now is that the Hamiltonian for this system of one dimensional lattice of spins still only depends on, you know, regardless of whether I'm thinking of this as a classical system or a quantum mechanical system, it still only depends on the z components of the spin. So this is in some sense a generalization of that two spin model that I'd written down earlier. If your j of mod i minus j was non-zero only for nearest neighbor interactions, then it would be your familiarizing model. Otherwise, it's something else. And you could think of some other dependence on the distance between the spins. 
you will see uh, not in this lecture but in the next lecture for concreteness I will consider a model in which this is decreasing exponentially with distance. So this is not what you would call a long range model. This is still a short range model despite the fact that there is that you know this is non zero for all mod i minus j it's still short range because if you assume it's exponentially decreasing there is a fundamental length scale over which this decreases and so long range models typically as you you know would have learned from michael kastner's lectures are those for which there is no such length scale so this, so it's still not going to be long ranged but for the time being let's also not you know worry about the exact dependence of this on i minus j okay and so so this was the classical model and the corresponding quantum mechanical model is simply going to have hats on top of all of these objects okay so and so quantum mechanically you just make them wear hats that's it and they still spin half objects so classically once again what will happen is that if you so all of this is now classical if you write down the equations of motion for this system you will once again get equations of motion just like for the two spin system the only difference now is that this magnetic field is going to depend on all the other spins i mean so earlier for even in the earlier case it depended on all the other spins except that all the others simply meant the only, the other spin that we had now of course you know we have a full lattice of spins so h i here is going to be a summation over j and this is going to be in the z hat direction so that's all there is so once again you can see that qualitatively the dynamics is very much the same which is that the z components of the spins don't evolve these are constants of motion and as far as the parallel components of the spin are concerned you know so they're just going to rotate and so this so any spin i is just going to lama process about the local magnetic field and the local magnetic field is going to be given by the z components of all the other spins so once again even for this model you can see that regardless of what the parallel components of the other spins are regardless of what they're doing they are not influencing the evolution of the spin i so this evolution of spin i is only determined by the z components of all the other spins which are constants of motion once you know what they are in the initial conditions that's what they are throughout and <coughs> the initial components of the initial components of the parallel component of that spin itself so any information about the parallel components of the other spins Is, um, is simply not affecting the spin i so conversely you can think of a situation in which let's say you start the system out with all the other spins except a particular spin so let's say we choose this as a special spin for all the other spins let's assume that the initial orientation of the spin is such that the parallel component and the z component were the same magnitude so that you know that all these other spins were oriented at 45 degrees about the z axis in in some direction but this one special spin was something in which the orientation was let's say almost 85 degrees or something about the the z axis meaning that it had a large parallel component and a small perpendicular component but this dynamics would keep that parallel component confined to that spin itself now just to tell you why that's important and we'll see you know a different model a much more generic model in the next lecture if you had something like a heisenberg model which again i'm assuming all of you are familiar with if you're not i'll introduce it in the next lecture anyway where the hamiltonian didn't only involve the z components but was actually something like this and if you tried the same thing for the heisenberg model where you said that you know there's one special spin which had a large in plane component and all the other spins had comparable in plane and outer plane components then what would happen is that the this information about a large in plane component of one spin 
will actually reach the other spins because that would diffuse out. Okay? So it's not that that large n-plane component would be continuously confined to that one spin. It would actually move out and the other spins, you know, and so eventually these in-plane components would, this initial in-plane component would diffuse out, all the other in-plane components eventually would be roughly the same on average. And so that information that this large, in, that this initial spin had a large in-plane component would dissipate out into the whole system and eventually be lost even for the classical system, whereas here that doesn't happen. And so similarly, you know, just like in the case of two spins, if you now looked at the corresponding quantum mechanical system where I put hats, once again, all that would happen in the equation of motion is that everything would just end up with a hat. But qualitatively, the physics would remain the same, that this classical information in the quantum system that is contained in the expectation values of these operators would simply not propagate, would simply not move. It would just stay confined to whichever site it was in. And here by classical information, I'm really focusing on the, in, the, the expectation values of the in-plane components of the spin operators because the outer plane component is a constant of motion anyway. It's not going to change anyway. The only thing that could have possibly changed and moved is the in-plane component and even that doesn't change and move. Okay? But what we'll see in the next lecture is that despite the fact that this model treated quantum mechanically does not have in this sense any spread of classical information, it does actually have a spread of quantum mechanical information that the entanglement in the system, if you start the system out in a state that is initially unentangled, that entanglement is actually going to grow with time. And so if you had a system that was in the thermodynamic limit, if you had L sites, then in principle, if you evolve the system out to an infinite amount of time, that entanglement would diverge. If you, if by, you know, if you're quantifying the entanglement using this thing called the entanglement entropy. So that is what we'll see in the next lecture. And we'll also see how for this model, the entanglement actually evolves as a function of time, what kind of function of time it is, for which we will have to assume a specific form of j, i minus j. And I will assume that it's going to be exponentially decaying. And so we look at that. And then we look at, in the next lecture, what happens when you try to do the same things for a Heisenberg model, not for this kind of Eisen type model, for a Heisenberg model where even classically there's a spread of information where you have diffusion, what happens to the corresponding quantum mechanical model, and also what happens to the entanglement in such models. So that's going to be the theme of the next lecture. Okay, thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Is kind of a short range, but it depends upon what kind of JIG you are considering, right? So uh, you take power of one okay, so, so when you say does it depend upon, so the question is what is the it? Is it all right, so, so what I'll show you in the next lecture is that if you considered a JIJ which was of the form. Right? Then there's no spread of the classical information. But if you look at quantum information, as we'll see, and if you look at, in particular, the entanglement entropy as a measure of that quantum information for this model, we'll see that S grows as log t. But remember that, you know, but I've only written this sign here, not an equality sign. And so if you ask what is the prefactor here, the prefactor, of course, would depend on the value of this length scale that I've put in. So what is in so at least if you assume this kind of form of the decay of J, what is independent of the specific value of the length scale over which you have the decay is the log. The log doesn't care about that. So so the functional form of the time dependence being a log is independent of what this is, but this goes in as a prefactor. Now, if you had some other kind of decay, not an exponential, that's what you were saying, right? If you're looking at some general form of the decay, is that, that was your question? So if this wasn't an exponential, let's say, if this was a power law, if it was truly long range, then of course it turns out that 
the entanglement as a function of time would actually increase faster than log t. And typically, you know, for these long range models, and I think Michael Kastner might have even shown you some data for his model, you will see that, you know, they can, these things can also increase as power laws. So the specific form of j i minus j will determine that. But regardless of what, in this kind of model, regardless of what form of j i minus j i choose, all of this still remains the same. The fact that there is no spread of classical information is completely independent of any particular choice of j i minus j. Indeed, we don't even have to confine ourselves to just two spin interactions. If you added higher spin interactions, say three spin interactions or four spin interactions, as long as the spin components involved were only the z components of the spin, once again, there would be no spread of the classical information. So, so we'll, we'll see this uh, in the next lecture.